Yeah, I always get asked this and I preference it. I, um, quick background, I launched a company called TuneCore, and it became the largest music distribution company in the world, uh, distributing more music by more artists than any other entity on the planet. They earned over half a billion dollars. Basically became the size of EMI in three years in regards to digital music sales. And a couple of years ago, launched something called Global Publishing Administration, which was the last time I was here where we talked about the six legal copyrights you get and how you make additional money as the songwriter. In July of last year, I was thrown out of my own company along with the two other founders. So it's now a, a what I'll call a bad cover band without a heart. It's really upsetting. That being said, uh, it's been an interesting journey since I've left there, which ties into this, which is uh, YouTube, which to me is, is really interesting. And along the way, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I hate standing still, but I think I have to because of the lighting, right? So I won't be paid if I just go up and down, that's why. Uh, what's interesting is before I even get into YouTube, your money and how to get it and why you've earned it, uh, it's interesting to think about how all this came about, right? So traditionally you record music, you write a song and you record it. And that piece of recorded music has two copyrights in it. And one is for the recording of the song. So let's go to Arista Records. They hire Whitney Houston to sing a song. And when they're done, the recording of the song is owned by Arista Records. That's one of the copyrights. The second copyright is owned by the person that wrote the lyrics and the melody to the song. And in this case, it's actually, you guys know who? Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton wrote the song, I Will Always Love You. So Arista Records hired Whitney Houston to sing Dolly Parton's song. And when they're done, they have a recording. That recording has two copyrights in it. One for Arista Records for the recording and one for Dolly Parton for the lyrics and the melody. If you're curious, the lyrics and the melody are represented by a C with a circle around it, and the recording is represented by a P with a circle around it. The P stands for phonogram and the C stands for copyright. So those are the two pieces of copyright in every piece of recorded music. They're joined at the hip, but they also kind of work differently. And traditionally what we did as a music industry is we would exploit the copyright. We'd find ways to make money for the people that own those copyrights off of it. And the way we traditionally did it in the music industry would be by selling pre-recorded music. You'd walk into a record store, you'd buy a CD or a piece of vinyl. You just bought it as a consumer, ka-ching, and that generates revenue for the people that own the copyright. So, right, so what we had were consumers were going out and they'd buy pre-recorded music, myself included, and we'd go home and we'd listen to it after we got it, and that was basically it. That's what we, we would do with it, aside from the occasional mixtape to try to get someone to sleep with you. So, uh, come on. Uh, so, so that, that's, that's what we would do with copyright is we would exploit it, license it, manufacture it, and get people to buy it. And then the other way copyright traditionally would be exploited would be we'd listen to it on AM, FM radio, and it would appear on television, and that generated some revenue as well, primarily for the person that wrote the song, the Dolly Parton, not for Arista Records. Well, consumers changed the way they began to get music, right? I mean, we all stopped sort of beginning to buy physical and at one point sort of shifted into buying downloads, which was still buying pre-recorded music. So the same sort of concept still applied. You'd make money when the thing was bought and it would get split between the person that wrote the song and the person that owned the recording of the song. By the way, the person that wrote the song, I call it the lyrics and melody. It's also known as the composition. That's the industry jargon for it. And if you represent the rights to the lyrics and melody exclusively, the administrative rights to that, it's called publishing. That's what music publishing is, which is just a word. There's nothing about it that's legal. You could say bananas. It doesn't matter what you call it. So people began to shift the way they got music from buying, pre-recorded on vinyl and CD into downloading. Then what happened is we began to move into streaming. And what was interesting about that is we were no longer buying our own music and listening to it. We were renting somebody else's music. So who here uses Spotify? Anyone? Right? What you're doing is you're paying Spotify a fee or advertisers are paying Spotify a fee on your behalf to rent access to their music collection. That's all you're doing is you're borrowing your friend's music collection. It just happens to be everything in the world and available 24-7, etc. But you're renting someone else's music collection and when you stop paying them a fee, you no longer have access to that music collection. But what was interesting about that is you had this dynamic shift in the way money was being generated. It used to be money was generated when the thing was bought. The physical product was purchased. It was this one-time transaction. You bought it, 
in Walmart, Tower Records, Virgin Megastore, you know, Amoeba, whatever it might be. 1698 exchanges over the counter. That was it. That was the economic transaction. That was the whole nine yards. And what would happen is the store would take a piece of that, and then they would pass the rest of the money back to the distributor who would take a piece of that, who would pass it back to the record label, who would take a piece of that, who would give it back to the artist if they were recouped, who would take a piece of that, and some portion would get paid to the songwriter, the Dolly Parton, as well, for the manufacturer of the CD. With streaming, you get paid not when you buy it, but every time you listen to it. And that's what's radically different. I mean, one of my favorite Beatles songs is Paperback Writer. I did, I did, the guitar tone in that song is insane. I don't know how the fuck they did that. But every single time I listen to that song now, every single time, the entity that controls the rights to the recording of the song and the entity that controls the rights to the lyrics and melody, one or two entities or however many, get paid every single time. Think how many times you listen to your favorite song. Right? So the question that's out there in the marketplace for artists, well, is there going to be enough money for artists on streams? Will the number of times a song gets listened to end up equaling more or equal than how much the artist used to make when the pre-recorded music got sold? It's actually a loaded question because the majority of the world's artists never made a freaking penny off of the sale of pre-recorded music, and everyone seems to forget that most artists were never allowed in because you had A&R people, and of those artists that were allowed into major record labels, 98% of them failed, and of the 2% that succeeded, less than a half of a percent ever received a band royalty ever, ever, ever. So when you hear people complaining, and some industry professionals complaining, it's a bit disingenuous because we've never had a world of nirvana, no pun intended, where artists were just swimming in cash. I mean, we had Madonna, U2, and you know, you kind of run out very soon thereafter, right? Most artists just didn't make it. So we've never had this world of a fabulously wealthy artist. It never existed. Anyway, so that's the question, right? Will streaming sales offset pre-recorded music sales? And if you can remove a middleman, right, instead of the artist going to the record label to get into iTunes, it sells, iTunes pays the record label, they pay the artist, you've just inserted a middleman, and that middleman is taking a piece of the money if you're going directly from here to the artist, how does that impact things? Well, this is kind of funny. Take a full-length album back in the old days of Tower Records. It was for sale for sixteen or seventeen ninety-eight on the shelf of Walmart. Right? When that album sold, how much do you think the band earned in a, as a band royalty? Guess. But penny rate, guess. Off of seventeen ninety-eight, just throw it throw it, so it's fair. Ten percent off of seventeen ninety dollar seventy. Little high, around a dollar forty to a dollar seventy, so more or less right, right. So that what would happen is it would sell, but the band would be recouping an advance given to them, so they would never get the dollar seventy. Now let's go to iTunes. You sell a song for ninety nine cents. Stephen, how much do you make on a ninety nine cents download in iTunes? All right, seventy cents. You sell two songs, you made a dollar forty. That's as much money as you would make on selling a seventeen ninety eight dollar list price CD in Walmart. And you're not unrecouped, so it flows right back to you. You sell two songs on iTunes at 99 cents, you make the same amount of money as selling a 1798 list price CD in Walmart without manufacturing and co op, all this other stuff. So it's interesting. The cost of music got cheaper, but the net in the artist's pocket went up. Now we're getting over to streaming. Okay, so let's get back to streaming. So people are now paying to gain access to other people's music collections and stream it on demand. And every time they do that, the person that wrote the song and the person that owns the recording of the song are supposed to get paid. And they're fractions of pennies. But the really interesting thing on top of that is there's been a radical shift in what people do when they get music. When I used to get music, I usually did one thing with it. I either made the aforementioned mixed tapes or I would just listen to it. Now when consumers get music, they actually use it. Right? And they use it to put in YouTube videos. They use it to put on their blog. They use it to file share. They use it for scan and match. They use it to instant message. They actually be create another piece of copyrighted protected property somewhat using this other person's pieces of copyright protected property. They use music, and they're not supposed to, according to the way copyright law works. You're not supposed to take my song and my recording and stick it into a video. You need a license for that. That's the way this industry works. You can't do that. So we're the Recording Industry Associ Association of America, so we're going to sue your ass and stop you from doing it. Because who the hell are you to do this with our copyrights? And that's what that's all about, by the way. It's stopping other ent people or entities from using copyright. You can't do that. So let's alienate our consumer base and sue them. Anyway, along the way, the United States government said, wait a second, 
we got this new thing called the internet. And we don't quite know how this thing's going to pan out. And we, what we don't want to do is stifle it from growing into whatever it's going to become. Because if we do that, it'll never become this thing that could be great. So we want to have a way to protect them while simultaneously protect the copyright holders. And one of the ways we can do that is by creating something called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And what we're going to do is put something there called the Safe Harbor Provision. So Safe Harbor is you're a boat on a choppy sea and you can pull into a little harbor and the sea's not choppy, right? What they, the courts decided and what the government decided and passed legislation, the law around this is, if you're a website like YouTube, of a cold and you have a video on YouTube and that video has music in it and there hasn't been a license issued to YouTube from Arista Records as an example we don't want YouTube to be sued into oblivion so what we're gonna do is say YouTube we're gonna protect you from having your ass handed to you and what we're gonna do is put the burden on Arista Records to go and find their video their copyright being used in your videos on YouTube and when they find it they have to notify you, and then you'll have to take it down. If they do that, you can't be sued. It's called the safe harbor provision. And this is why YouTube is continuing to grow and has been able to grow in other websites. If users, this person right here, goes to YouTube, uploads a video, YouTube has no idea what's in your video. It turns out it's got the Beatles in it, right? What happens is EMI Records finds it on YouTube, says YouTube, you can't have Beatles in his video, YouTube takes it down. Does that make sense? Right, that's a safe harbor provision. Well, unfortunately, it's a bit of a whack-a-mole game, as you can imagine, because there's a lot more of us than there are of them. And there's just billions and billions of videos going into YouTube. But what's most fascinating is that we as consumers, as music fans, are now using the music. So the question is, what would happen if we could find a way to monetize the use of that music? Right, right now, we've been fighting it. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Well, wait a second. Why don't we find a way to make money off of it? So this ties into the YouTube opportunity because YouTube is the number one place on the planet where people go to use music. It's also the number one destination site on the planet for people to listen to music. You know, you guys probably know better than I, most people under 30 literally go to YouTube to listen to music. More go there than Spotify, Rhapsody, Deezer, Symphony, all the other music, digital music services combined. I mean, YouTube's like up here. So there's some stats. They have more than a trillion annual views. These are now outdated, by the way. They have over 800 million unique users each month. That's actually over 1 billion unique users each month now. And it's insane. That's like, what? The, how, what's the population of the planet? Jesus. Okay. 4 billion hours of video are watched each month. 25 billion views a month of videos with music in them. 25 billion views a month of videos with music in them. 52 million people watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> 72 hours of video are uploaded every minute. 70% of YouTube traffic comes from outside of the United States. And as far as how it makes money, literally what they do is they put advertisements on their videos. That's it. They either put an ad on top of it with text or a banner, or they put an advertisement before it, in the middle, or at the end of it with a video commercial. That's it. 2011, they did about $3.6 in ad revenue. And in 2000. Uh, up, actually, that should be 2011, up 100, over, that second stat, up 103% over 2011, that should be up 103% over 2010. 2010, they did about 1.5. 2011, they did about 3.6. 2012, they're supposed to do in the neighborhood of 7 billion. Some people have them generating $15 billion in ad revenue off of YouTube over the next six years. The point is that as they get more videos, they can slap more ads on them and make more money. So now I'm going to tell you uh, I hope a semi-interesting story on how I discovered the YouTube opportunity and sort of got my mind around it. So I have this friend, his name is Scott, and Scott wrote the theme song to the NFL for Fox Television. Right? I mean, go Scott. That was like 17 years ago. I think he also wrote the theme song for Have a Coke and a Smile and Snickers and some other stuff. So Scott, as a songwriter, became a member of something called a performing rights organization. There's BMI and there's ASCAP uh, as examples. And those organizations represent the right of public performance. Right? You get six legal copyrights the minute you make a song tangible. These six copyrights, let's see if I can remember them. The right of reproduction, the right of public performance, the right of derivatives, the right of digital transmission, the right of public display, and the right of derivatives. 
those are your six legal copyrights, right? So there are two of them. Uh, sorry, one of them is the right of public performance. So every time Scott's song is performed on television, Scott's supposed to be paid. It doesn't matter where in the world this happens. Now, how in the world is Scott supposed to monitor global television? He can't just like most of us can't. So he goes to BMI or ASCAP or CSAC and says, I want to hire you to work for me. And he grants them the right to the right of public performance. And then it's their job to go out and monitor the world to do this. Right? And so they go out in the world and they do this and they come back to him. And about, I don't know, a decade ago, they came back and Scott got the royalty statement and thought it might not be accurate. Like, I think I'm getting more play on television than I'm being accounted to for here. I should be getting paid more. So to prove it, he went out and he built a system. And it took him a long time to do this. And this is my presentation of it. He created a giant TiVo, or DVR, where he literally now records in 14 countries, 355 network broadcast television stations, and records what they broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every microsecond, onto a freaking hard drive. <coughs> right, so he's got all the hundreds of thousands of hours of TV programming from around the world. And the second thing he did is he went and he recorded a catalog of music and he began to license it to put into TV shows. And he actually didn't charge a fee for it. And he's like, he did what's called gratis licenses, no upfront fee for either side. And the reason he did that is he then went on into this third thing. He figured out a way, he hired someone to create an algorithm to take his recordings and create a digital fingerprint of these recordings. And he put an emphasis on something called dirty audio. In other words, if we're at a football game and there's 10,000 people cheering, this technology had the ability to filter out the people cheering and all this noise and pick up on this tiny little sound of music in the background. It doesn't have to be in the foreground, background music. And so he created these, this algorithm or hired someone to create this algorithm and he fingerprinted his catalog of music and then he smashed it up against these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of television looking for uses of his songs on TV. And lo and behold, he found an 80% discrepancy between what was being reported to him versus actual. And now he had the proof, right? And he figured, and he created this thing because he figured this was happening to everybody, not just him. And he created a company where people could pay him a monthly fee and they could send him copies of recordings of songs and he would fingerprint them. And then lo and behold, he could troll through television and show them real time. They could log in, see the date, the time, the country, the duration, the use of all this stuff on television and click a little button and actually play the song back. So you have verifiable proof that your music was being used, right? Because if you can audit the use of music, you can monetize it. So he created the system and he called it TuneSat. And any of you can go there. They even have like a free trial. And he'll fingerprint your recordings and come back to you with a report on where your music's being used. And how you use that information is up to you, although there's certain ways you can do it. You go back to your PRO and say, you underreported to me, you should pay me more. And then they'll fight with you. But ultimately, look, that's their job to pay you when your music is used in TV. Anyway, so that was cool. And we were talking about this. And he, about a year ago, expanded this technology for his company. And he did the exact same thing where he fingerprinted his own recordings, but now he moved on to doing it on the internet. And he began to troll the internet, looking for uses of his recordings online. And he found, I don't know, five, 6,000 websites using it. Everything from like Microsoft.com to used car dealerships to Toyota, or I don't know if it was Toyota, but about 5,000. And he used intelligence to whittle out I'll call the chaff, the stuff that didn't matter. You don't want to, like, who cares if a 13-year-old has uploaded something to their, to their blog or something. And he found, like, three to 400 places that were using it, and he caught them with their hand in the cookie jar. You can't just take Stephen Kravis's music and put it on Microsoft.com without getting a license from Stephen Kravis. It doesn't work like that, right? Your music has value. They have to get a license from you. So he found these sites, about 300, 400, that didn't have a license, sent out one email to them, said, thank you very much for using my music. Here's the link where it's happening. Uh, you don't have a license. It'd be privileged to issue you a retroactive license for the use. You know, and about three, four weeks later, he got in about a quarter million dollars, right? And that was on some portion of the people. Because, you know, they got caught. You can't do that. And, you know, and then he found ways to automate the system and, and find more places using it. So, by the way, that's something all of you can use as well. And no, I'm not an employee of TuneSat. I just love the technology. So he now had a way to find out when people were using his music on television and on the internet. 
And I said to him, wow, that's really cool, man. You, you got the magic glasses. Do you ever see the, the movie They Live from like 1986 with Roddy Allen Piper in it? All right, thank God. <laughs> really bad movie. There's actually an episode of South Park where, uh, who is it? It's Jimmy and the other kid. You get into a, a, a fight, and it's, it's a frame-by-frame -frame recreation of this fight from this movie where Roddy Allen Piper's trying to get this other guy to put on these glasses. And the reason why he's trying to get him put on the glasses is when he put on the glasses, you can see who's an alien and see the subliminal messages. Well, to me, <laughs> Toonsat is the magic glasses. I look at the world and I see the world. I put on their glasses and I see where music is actually being used. And if you can see where music is actually being used, then you can go and go, you need to give me a license. I need to give you a license and you need to pay me and I need to administer that money back. So I asked him, do you also troll through YouTube since you're on the internet? He said, yeah. What you find, he's like, oh, I don't really care because to me, YouTube is, isn't really a place we can make money. It's more about you know, notifying them to take down and, and that's not what this is about. I said, really, you can make money. How many videos did you find? And we did some research and he found like 3,000 videos, 4,000 videos on YouTube that had his music in it. And those, I went and I looked at them then and I added up the views and he had like 400 million views on these videos. You guys ever see Annoying Orange? Yeah, okay. So that, that, there was an Annoying Orange video which had like 120 million views with one of his songs in it. And I said, you know, let me explain to you how YouTube works as far as making money. <laughs> so uh, if you can go to the next slide and we'll get into way YouTube works. All right, and let me start with a simple explanation. Three fingers wiggling. I take a video of that. I own the copyright to my three fingers wiggling video. No one else can use it, right? Harry Potter, Warner Brothers can't take my three fingers wiggling and stick it into a Harry Potter movie. They need to get a license for me to do that. So when you make a video on your iPhone, your Android phone, or wherever you do it, that's a piece of copyright protected material that you own. Now, what you're doing when you go to YouTube is you're uploading it to YouTube and you're granting to YouTube the right to let other people watch your video. You give them a license. YouTube has a program called the YouTube Partner Program, which is open to everybody, where you can become a partner of YouTube. And what that means is you're saying to YouTube on those, my video that I uploaded to you, I'm going to grant you the right to make some money on that. You can put advertisements on it or before it. And when you do, we're going to share the revenue. That's the YouTube Partner Program. So if you create a really exciting three fingers wiggling and you get a lot of views on it, you'll make more money than if you make a very boring three fingers wiggling. And the way it kind of works is YouTube and Google will sell advertisements into it. There's different types of ads, and I can get into that if you want. And it makes money because the advertiser pays YouTube for the ad or Google for the ad. They take 45% and they pass through the other 55% to you. That's the simple, basic economics of the way YouTube works. So when you go to YouTube and you sign up, you have an account with YouTube. That account is called a channel. Right? That's what's called a channel. And when you upload your video, you're uploading it to your channel. You can upload one video, you can upload two videos, you can upload a thousand videos. There's a guy named Alan. And Alan created an account on YouTube and he decided he was going to upload videos of people talking about video games. World of Warcraft, uh, and the Laura Croft, whatever, whatever the kids are playing these days. Um, Easter eggs or whatever it might be. And literally, camera like this one and started recording this. And over the years, he has, I don't know how many videos he has up there, but his videos in his YouTube channel now get over 1.1 billion views a month. That's a lot of views. Not only does he get over 1.1 billion views a month, but because he's on YouTube, he has information on all the people that watch it, how old they are, where they live, how long they watch, when he loses them, etc. And if you get to the point where you get enough people watching your videos in your channel on YouTube, and you're a partner of YouTube, you can approach YouTube and go, you know what? Right now, you're selling my inventory. I've created it. I'm going to use metaphorically. I've created a TV show. Here it is on YouTube and you're selling ads into it. I want to sell some of those ads myself. So let's get into the money. You're three fingers wiggling. You upload it. You know, not many people are going to watch it. Maybe you're doing 30 cents to a dollar per 1,000 views. As more and more people watch it, maybe you get 100,000 people a month or watching the videos in your channel, 
200,000, 10,000, you know, pick your number, the numbers can go up because you're more popular. More popular TV shows, more popular channels make more advertising money, right? If you've got a popular video, ooh, it's like a hit TV show for its 20 seconds. So the ad revenue can move from 50 cents to a dollar per 1,000 views. It's called a CPM. $2,000, uh, $3, $4, $7, $8, $9. If you're getting a billion views a month, you're in the, you know, like five to $12 range on each one of these videos it can get really high but what you can also do is you can take some percentage of your monthly views and you can package them together and you can go and do your own direct advertising sales I hire people to come work for me they're literally an ad sales team and I get a contract with YouTube and say I want to do some of my own direct ad sales instead of you selling ads into my videos I want to do it and I go and I approach New Line Cinema because they've got the new Spider-Man movie coming out. And I have all these people that watch my reviews of the Spider-Man video game over here. And I know the 13 to 25-year-old males that live in the northeastern part of the United States or whatever it might be. And I can go to New Line Cinema and I can say, you know, I've got your demographic. I can prove it. They're watching my freaking videos. This is who you're trying to reach. So I want to charge you $30, $40, $50 per 1,000 views. And you know what? New Line Cinema is going to pay it. Because as you're able to give the advertiser their exact access to who they're looking for, they're willing to pay more money. So you can really drive up your CPMs. Now, that's what a channel is. You can do a channel on diapers, diaper care, babies, dogs, cat. You know, you can do a vertical on anything you want. Another example of a channel is called Vivo. Vivo went out and got the rights to Three Fingers Wiggling, only their music videos. They're Britney Spears, they're Smells Like Teen Spirit, they're Justin Timberlake, they're Radiohead, they're the official music videos. And they created a channel on YouTube called the Vivo Channel, and they upload these videos into the Vivo Channel, and there's advertising that appears in front of it, and they do some of their own direct ad sales, and they get a lot of views, somewhere between two to three billion views a month. And they're doing, my guesstimate is somewhere between 200 to 300 million dollars a year in ad revenue off of YouTube, off of music videos. It's MTV. This guy, Alan, he's doing pretty well for himself as well, in my guesstimation. But here's this other cool part of YouTube on the channel side. So I'm Alan again, and I'm uploading videos to YouTube about video games. And I learned that this gentleman right here, also has a YouTube account where he's uploading stuff. Look, you got an Atari joystick, perfect. So he's, he's uploading videos on you, uh, video games as well to YouTube. And I learn about you, and maybe you've got 100,000 views a month, 10,000 views a month, whatever it might be. I call you up and I say, hey, listen, keep control of your account, but I have an umbrella that will allow me to link my account with your account on the business side. So I'm getting 1.1 billion views, you're getting 100,000. Together we're getting 1.11 whatever it is, billion views a month, right? And, oh, you have an account too. Let's add you into my umbrella. Add your views in, and so do you. And by adding all of you under my umbrella, we increase the monthly views of what's called a network. My network is my channel plus all of you under my umbrella. Each one of you control your own channels. You upload your own videos. But I get the benefit of adding together you plus you plus you plus you plus you, all of you together with mine. And guess what? When I do direct ad sales, I have more ad inventory that I can go and get. I can raise the amount of money that you're making. I'll give you access to tools to make more videos. Uh, I'm a big deal with YouTube, so if there's any problems, I can deal with it. I can teach you best practices. And that's what's called a multi-channel network, MCN. That's, so you might have heard this, you might not have, but this is what a multi-channel network is. And this is right now all the rage out there. You've got companies like Maker Studio. Um, God, there's a whole bunch of them. Big Frame. I'm forgetting off the top of my head. And what they do is they create their own content, and then they find other people that are also creating content in those areas, and they network them all together, and they aggregate all these views, and they drive up the ad revenue, and then they do direct ad sales, and I put that dude to sleep. And I like to totally go over there and like take off my shirt. And uh, they make, this is how they're trying to make money. 